हरे कृष्णा Is there is there need need for some uh, translation arrangement here? No. I just speak in English. Okay. Good mood. Clear mind. Clear heart. Yes, this is what we are aiming at in Krishna consciousness. This society is called the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. I S K C O N. Uh, K stands for Krishna, and C O N Con stands for consciousness. So the essence of everything that we do here. Is these two, Krishna and consciousness. And first of all, we have to start with consciousness. This is where we begin. We're all conscious beings. In fact, there is no way to separate consciousness from your being, because you can have no understanding of being without, first of all, your consciousness, your awareness. As I often point out, there are people who claim to be skeptical or to be even materialists, uh, scientific-minded rationalists. This, that they give themselves so many titles, and they mean to say that well, I think reality is actually only material. And you people, you Hare Krishna people or other religious people, you have some faith in something spiritual. But I have not seen that. I only see this matter, physical matter. So I have faith in that because this matter I can see and I can hear and I can touch and I can taste. That is immediate matter. And I think. Consciousness is, there's a fancy word, epiphenomenal, huh? epiphenomenal, that consciousness is an epiphenomenon, means it is just a product of matter, that in, in the brain, in the nervous system, there's some chemical reactions going on, and somehow out of these chemical reactions, there's an aura coming out electrical field or something, and that is what we call consciousness. This is epiphenomena. So, a person may believe that, he may argue like that, but you see, these ideas, they're based on his consciousness. He talks about the reality of matter, but first of all, you have to perceive matter, and that is through consciousness. So the first thing you start with is always consciousness. It is incorrect, logically incorrect, to say, no, I start with matter. <laughs> because if your consciousness becomes dysfunctional, say your senses no longer allow your consciousness to be in touch with this world, then what can you say about matter? You're not <coughs> conscious of it. So matter is also now a mystery to you. You see? And sometimes that happens to people. They fall into coma so they're still alive, but they have no awareness of the world around them. So we see that happen to people. They can lose their awareness of this physical world. So from this we can understand it is also possible to lose one's awareness of the spiritual world. And as a matter of fact, that is our condition right now. We are only semi-conscious. There are those who are totally unconscious, as I said, not even aware of their physical bodies. This is called coma. Sometimes people are lying in hospital with machine, you know, life support system. Sometimes for years, the 
uh, relatives are paying the doctors to keep the person alive in the hope that one day the person may again wake up. The uh, a story about this, they said, uh, you know, it was in Sweden maybe, there was one woman who was unconscious for something like 60 years. Actually, she wasn't even in hospital. She just went to sleep one night and didn't wake up. She was still alive and somehow her relatives were taking care of her. But she didn't wake up again for 60 years. So this is, this happens. So that is unconsciousness. And we now, we are only semi-conscious. Because we are in material consciousness. So just like there is unconsciousness and then there is dream state, you see, in the Vedic language, uh, susupti and svapna. Susupti means uh, when you're totally unconscious. Everyone at night, when you go to sleep, there is some periods when your awareness is all in darkness. Uh, and then sometimes you come up a little bit out of that total dark state. And there are dreams. And this is called svapna. Uh, so we go at night in between these two and sleep. Uh, sometimes up in svapna, sometimes down in susupti. And this is admitted, this is very old knowledge. Uh, known for thousands of years in India. Recently, Modern science has also understood this. They have studied the movements of the eyes of people at sleep. And they see when they dream, and the eyes are moving rapidly. This is called REM, rapid eye movements. And then sometimes the eyes are not moving. And so they wake the people up. Then what, what were you just experiencing? Oh, nothing. It's just totally blank. When the eyes are moving, wake them up. Oh, I was having a dream. So they have... Only recently in West, <laughs> they have verified by science, which was well known for literally thousands of years. These states of consciousness are all explained in uh, the Vedic scriptures. So, susupti, so unconsciousness, svapna, dreaming state. Then jagrata means wakefulness. And then there is a state beyond called turiya, which means the fourth level. Turiya means the fourth level. Why the fourth? That means beyond the three modes of material nature. Because susupni, total unconsciousness, this is tamoguna, complete tamoguna, complete ignorance. And svapna is rajoguna. Krishna explains this to Uddhava in uh, Canto 11 of chapter of, uh, of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, so, now this is interesting that he, Krishna has said this svapna dream state is a product of the mode of passion. This is interesting for us as human beings. Because the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, third canto, tells us that the human being, Manusha, is Raja Svabhava. That means human nature is generally in the mode of passion. Now what is this mode of passion? We explain mode of ignorance, uh, darkness, delusion, uh, unconsciousness, also madness, also just crazy behavior when a person is intoxicated, drunk, and they act in a crazy way, they talk. And this is all symptomatic of Tamukun. Or Rajoguna, the mode of passion, when one has very strong and specific desires, one wants to become wealthy, one wants to become famous, one wants to have uh, you know, nice sexual relationships, one wants to enjoy this world. And so they work hard, this is passion. They work for their goals. Hmm? So this is better than ignorance, more serious, but still, unfortunately, the goal is only something temporary. Material. So the nature of the human being is to be in that mode of passion. And that means generally, psychologically speaking, 
All human beings, even when they're awake, they're dreaming. Because they're always projecting their desires on the world around them. You see, this is what happens in dream. When we sleep at night, what is happening in dreaming? What is happening is that our desires, which are all packed into the heart, and the mind is seated in the heart, actually. The mind works in the brain, but sits in the heart. You know, you can say the brain is the office of the mind. But the heart is the home of the mind. This is very important. This is also told in the Vedas. So the root of the mind is the heart. And our desires that uh, uh, we have uh, exercised over many, many, many lifetimes, not just this lifetime, but countless lifetimes, those desires are in the heart in seed form, just like so many seeds in the earth. And you know, according to different seasons, uh, then these different seeds, they sprout and they grow. Just like there's a certain kind of lettuce. What is it called? I don't know. Ice lettuce or winter lettuce or something. But it will grow when there's snow on the ground. <coughs> uh, when it's very cold, then this lettuce will grow. When it's hot, when it's summertime and all the other plants are flourishing, this plant will not grow. You see? So at different seasons, different times, different places, different circumstances in our life, then different of these seeds of desires, they sprout. Just like perfect example, very, very apt example everyone knows, is that age which is called puberty, when a boy or girl reaches 11, 12 years old. So before that age, they, we say children are innocent, you know. Because they, they, don't, they don't understand anything about sex. They don't have any feeling for that. Uh, so they're innocent. But suddenly they reach that age, 11, 12 years old, and they start to become very interested in the opposite sex. Why? Because that is a time for this desire, which was already there, now to start growing. And so many other examples can be given. But that is a very apt one that everyone knows. So, at night when we sleep and dream, it means, yes, our consciousness is removed from this world, this waking state. Uh, but the mind becomes like a screen in sleep, in, in a movie theater or TV screen. And then from out of the core of our heart, our desires just come out and are projected on the mind. You see? And then, and, and of course, in dreams, these, uh, these experiences are rather chaotic. Dreams often don't make much sense. They're just a jumble up of so many desires coming out one after the other. You know, there was an art movement, which is still, still going on today, but it started in about the, the 1920s. Salvador Dali was one of the big acharyas. It was called Surrealism. So Salvador Dali, with his melted watches, <laughs> he painted melted watches and things like that, he would uh, paint his dreams. He would just make pictures of his dreams. And that still goes on today. So yes, dreams are simply our desires projected on the screen of our mind. But we human beings, you see, we're so much caught in our desires, that when we wake up, when we're so-called awake, this process is still going on. We're still projecting our desires on the world around us. There's a little more order to our experience when we're awake because we're actually in touch with something called objective. When you're at sleep at night, there's only this screen of the mind, so anything goes. You know, any kind of crazy thing can happen. Your desires are just flowing out onto the mind. But now there's, there's a so-called objective, physical background that kind of gives more order to our experience. But still the same thing is going on. You see, just like a young man walking down the street. He's walking down the sidewalk in uh, Antwerp. And he sees coming the other way a young girl, beautiful young girl. 
very good looking young girl. So he looks at her and from that distance already his mind starts to cook up all kinds of desires and dreams and imaginations. You see, uh, he may or may not act on them. If he's kind of a shy person, then he just has all kinds of, as he's looking at her, he may have all kinds of lusty thoughts about this woman. Or he doesn't dare talk to her. Or he may act on it and say hello and try to, as they say, chat her up. Try to make a relationship because he's attracted to her. Or, you know, so this goes on between men and women. It goes on with so many things. You're walking down the street, also you see a sharp-looking car, say a Maserati. <laughs> and everyone just stops and looks at, wow, Maserati. And they start to dream, what if it was my car? What if I was behind the wheel? You know, and then everyone would look at me. <laughs> so you see, the mind is still dreaming, even when we're awake. So much of what we're accepting as real is a product of the mind, and actually uh, to distinguish between now, our present experience, where the mind in ends and where sense objects begin, that is a very, very difficult problem. That has been always a problem in philosophy. This is called the problem of subjectivity versus objectivity. Subjectivity simply means, I am the subject. See, or you, you are the subject. You're having your subjective experience. You see, and, and, and that can be very different between two people. Just like uh, I have recently come from India. I was uh, six months in India. Now I've come to Holland and to Belgium. And here, you people are calling this is this uh, season summer. To me, <laughs> this is not summer, this is still winter for me. And I'm having all kinds of health problems as a result. <laughs> to me, it's too cold. I have to have, you know, chada. <laughs> uh, so, so you see, and, and someone here may be thinking, oh, it's nice, it's nice out. It's because you're used to it. But this is subjective, you see. So, so what, you know, within objectively, what is it really? I say it's cold, you say, no, it's, it's, it's okay, it's warm. But what is it really? That's the question. And in so many things, so many things, everything, this question comes up. Where does subjectivity end and objectivity begin? And we find this is even a problem in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Great sages. This is in the 11th canto, where the four Kumaras go to Brahma. Huh? Krishna is relating this story. Uh, it happened in the beginning of the universe. Uh, Krishna is telling Uddhava that the four Kumaras, Brahma's sons, who are great sages, they went to their father, who is the greatest Vedic sage. And this was their question uh, about this subjectivity, objectivity. Uh, where, the, you know, how the mind is interlocked with the sense objects, and how can they ever be separated because it seems like our mental functions are defined by what we see and what we hear and what we taste and what we touch and what we smell. Just imagine if you could uh, uh, completely erase sight, touch, smell, taste and hearing from your mind. Would that still be a mind? Hmm? If your mind had absolutely no more impression of senses and sense objects, would it still be a mind? Can, could you conceive of that as a mind? I don't think so. Because we see that our mind, actually how does it function? It is a place of taste, isn't it? <coughs> when, uh, of course the tongue is a place of taste. But when we, in generally, when we say someone has good taste, you know, when we compliment someone the way they dress, oh, you have such good taste, a combination of colors and style of the way you dress. So, the, we go visit their home and and we see their house is very nice, and we say, oh, such good taste. Or we hear some kid, you know, with the green mohawk hair, listen to the music, we hear the music he likes, and we go, wow, what bad taste. <laughs> Sounds like a lawnmower. 
<laughs> so, so, you know, this, and this is all the mind. The mind is the place that we, where we form our taste or our opinion of our experience. And that's how the mind works. Sankalpa, vikalpa. It, it accepts something, sankalpa. This is nice. This is a nice thing. I want to enjoy that. Or something else, oh, this is bad. I don't like this. Get it away from me. That's what the mind is all about. So the mind's own function is defined by these sense objects. And similarly, the sense objects are defined by the mind. You see, the mind and also the intelligence. Because what we accept as sense objects, that is very much according to the shape of our mind. For example, here's, here's, we have some doors here, wooden doors. Now for us, they're just doors. And we don't really... It's just something you, you open to walk through and then you close behind you. The door doesn't have that much, unless it's locked and you have to be in. <laughs> then it becomes significant. But otherwise, you know, especially inside the house, doors are not, we don't really notice them so much. But there's, you know, this certain kind of insect called termite. Uh, wood is its food. You know, wood, mm, something to eat, breakfast, lunch. <laughs> so a termite will see the door or this tabletop in a very different way than we will. <laughs> this is food, something to eat. Mm. <laughs> the termite comes on this tabletop, he'll start feasting, Sunday feast. <laughs> you see? And it's because of the mind. The termite has a different kind of mind than we do. So we, we don't even notice this. Is it a table? Just put something on it. Never mind. But termite, oh, lunch. Let me eat. You see? So by our mind, we, def we give value to the things around us. Some things we're, we're very attentive to, we pay very much attention. Ha, just like my spiritual master, he gave a very nice example. Because this, this is different between human beings. So a very nice example he gave is the difference between a small child and an adult. Uh, in regards to money, you see? Now, if a small child finds a hundred euro note, I'm talking about like two or three year old child, uh, for this, this is just something, you know, maybe puts in the mouth and chews, see how it tastes, or tears it up, or, you know, plays with it, or puts it in the fire to see it burn, just something to play with, you see, just a piece of paper, some nice colors, you see, and for an adult, oh, that's 100 euros, that's something valuable. A child doesn't understand this. So my spiritual master said, if you see a child with uh, such a bill in their hand, uh, and, you know, a child, children, they become attached to anything, they pick up anything, then it's theirs. So it's not so nice just to take it from them, because they'll start to cry. But what you can do in such a case is you can just take one little piece of candy, one cent candy, and say to the child, here, I give you this and you give me that. And the child will, oh yes, oh yes. Because what is this? Just some paper. I don't like But candy, that's very nice. So that's for a child, very good deal. <laughs> 100 euros for one cent piece of candy. <laughs> but for an adult, that's absurd. You see? And that's also because of the money. The 100 euro note is the same thing in either case, but we put a value on it. So you see, this is a, this even in, 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 uh, among the Vedic sages, uh, the Kumaras went to Brahma with this question uh, about subjectivity, objectivity, how to separate the mind from the sense objects, can it be done? And even Brahma himself couldn't answer. Even he stopped and thought and thought and thought and thought. And he could not, he couldn't figure it out either. So that's how the Hamsa avatar, the Lord, Lord Krishna in the form of Swan, he appeared and he discussed this very lofty philosophy with, the, with Brahma and the four Kumaras. And he pointed out to them, what he pointed out to them is that, you see, this problem that you're wrestling with is coming about because you have slipped off of your real identity. Because the way the Kumaras were formulating the question was, is that, you see, uh, we are meant, we human beings, we are meant for liberation. 
you got, I think many of you know this, certainly those who, who are devotees and who have read Srila Prabhupada's books, you know this, that every species of life we can see has a particular special function. So what is the human purpose or human function? And that special human function that sets, sets it apart from dogs and cats and fish and monkeys and all other creatures is that we, if we use this human life, particularly human mind and senses and intelligence properly, we can achieve liberation. We can rise up out of this embodied consciousness and come to pure consciousness. We can do this. So this was the problem the Kumaras were wrestling with. That in order to do this then, to achieve this liberation, we have to become detached from the material world. But how can you detach the mind from the sense objects? They were, they were considering it and thinking, it's not possible. It's not possible. And the Hamsa avatar, he said, yes, that's true. But you see, that's not the problem. You have made this into the problem of how to achieve liberation, how to free my mind from its attachment to sense objects. But actually what you have to know is that you are not the mind. Your mind is also a material thing. It's subtle material. There's two words, shtula and linga in Sanskrit. So shtula means gross things, like this is shtula sharira, this physical body made of flesh and blood and bones. It's a gross thing. Gross means you can't directly see it. It has mass. It's you know, obviously there. <laughs> and, but we have another body, just like you have overclothes and you have underclothes. You see, overclothes everyone sees, but underclothes, <laughs> you hope <laughs> nobody has seen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so similarly, we have gross physical body everyone sees, but we have subtle, a subtle body underneath, mental body. And this is called Linga Shavira. So uh, this is where our thoughts uh, are taking place about this material world. This is, it's the subtle body that focuses our consciousness. It's like a lens, you see, like your glasses. You know, those who wear glasses or contact lenses means if they're not there, then you don't see so well. Everything's blurry. Or you want to look up at, close at the moon and see the features of the moon, you need a telescope. These two lenses. And then you can... See. So similarly, for the soul who is non-material to be able to interact with matter, gross physical matter, to see it and to touch it and experience it, all this, then we need also a lens to focus our consciousness on matter. And this is called the mind, the mental body. So the mind brings this material world into focus, into the focus of our consciousness. So the mind is also a material thing, subtle material thing. So Hangsa Avatar told them, this question of liberation is only answered when one rises above both the objects of the senses, what we see in this world, and also the mind. When we understand that I am not the mind, but I am eternal, pure spirit soul, pure consciousness, and that is the beginning of this, I told you, fourth stage, Turiya, hmm? above the modes of nature. So right now, we human beings, as I said, we're, we tend to be in the mode of passion. That means we tend to dream while we're awake. Our desires are coming out of all of our senses. Our mind is running here and there. I like this, I don't like that. We're forming attachments to, to people, to places to circumstances, to events, and other things we're, you know, becoming disgusted by, uh, trying to avoid. And these, but these things that we become attached to, that we want, you see, they're also temporary. So, in this way, Prabhupada used to say, daydream, nightdream. This is our experience. Nightdream, that we understand. How do you know? Think of this. How do you know? Because <laughs> this is a problem uh, uh, I remember finding in, in reading about Chinese uh, philosophy. They made this into a big problem. 
uh, there's, there's a Chinese aphorism that how do you know that uh, because at night you may dream you're a butterfly but how do you know that in the daytime you're still not that butterfly just dreaming that you're a person how do you know if you're <laughs> If you're a person or a butterfly. <laughs> now that's not actually such a big problem. Uh, because our waking experience, when we wake up, it's pretty much always the same thing. I mean, you wake up in your bedroom, you know, the same things are there. But your dreams at night are always so different, you see. And we, so we know that we're having a dream, because a dream, when you're having it, can be completely real. You know, you may dream that you're being chased by a tiger. Uh, and your heart is beating fast, you're sweating, you're reacting to that. You're actually experiencing real fear. A tiger is after me. But suddenly you wake up, and there you are in your bed, where you've woken up every morning for the last, you know, so many years. The same bed, the same alarm clock, you know, everything the same. Well, you know, I was just dreaming. Why? Because the dream ended. And, and then you're in your uh, regular waking situation. You see? That's how you know it's a dream. When you're in the dream, you don't know if it's a dream or not, most of the time. When you're having the dream, you think it's real. But when you wake up, then you know the difference. Oh yeah, that was a dream. You see? Because here I am, in my bed again. Good old bed, yes. Good old bedroom, good old alarm clock. Familiar things. Yes. But... Srila Prabhupada said, this so-called waking is also a dream. How is that? Because one day we will, in a sense, wake up from this too. And that is the time of death. At the time of death, all of this, this that we've been thinking is real, is important, and, you know, so many things are so important and must maintain strong attachments to them and control them and this and that and this and that. When death comes, it, it's all broken. It's all shattered. You see? You have no more access to it. See, one may, one may have a very strong relationship, husband to wife, wife to husband. But if you die, as strong as that was, it's broken. You can no longer relate with that person whom you thought was your nearest and dearest. So in that sense, that relationship was just a dream. Because now it's gone. It is gone. That house that you lived in, it is gone. That car that you drove, it is gone. That money that you had in your bank account, now it is gone. In America they always say about death, you can't take it with you. That's a common expression. It means in life, as much as you may have accumulated, uh, again, big house, bank balance, family, big car, etc., etc., you can't take it with you when you die. That you leave behind. So then what does it mean? That was all a dream. That was a dream because now the soul is going somewhere else. So my point is, is that in our common human consciousness, ordinary human consciousness, we are not actually awake. According to the Vedas, as I said, there's the svapna state, which is the mode of passion. Then there's a state called jagrata, wakefulness. And we're most, especially now, in this modern age, most human beings are not there. It means even when they get up out of bed, <laughs> they're still not awake. Why? Because jagrata, real wakefulness, means an awareness that I am different from the body. This is the mode of goodness. Mode of goodness, Lord Krishna explains in Gita, means all the gates of the body are illumined by knowledge, like the eyes and the ears and the nose and the mouth. These are gates by which we receive sensations. But they are illumined by knowledge. So that a person, Hare Krishna, in the mode of goodness, he's always aware, he always knows the difference between himself and this which is going on around, including the body. The body is also part of this world. You see? So he's always aware of the difference. 
This is Jagrata. This is wakefulness. This is mode of goodness. He still acts within the world. Yes. It doesn't mean that then he's doing nothing. He still acts within the world, but he's awake. He's fully aware that this that I'm experiencing is passing away by in time. That I am not this. Hmm? Aham Brahmasmi. I am spirit soul. I am not this body. This world is not my home. These people I'm interacting with, uh, they're also just sense impressions. Of course, the soul is there. But what I see of them, these are just sense impressions, temporary. Beyond that, beyond that, then there's the Turiya platform. The Turiya, which is the platform of full realization. Because you see, even in the mode of goodness, this wakefulness, one can be awake, know that I'm not the body, be very wise, be very, you see, seeing very far, seeing very deep into things. But still one can fall victim to pride. You see, a wise man, if he's thinking, yes, I know more than these other people. They're foolish. They have to come to me for knowledge. You see, if one is thinking like that, then that still means he's tinged by material consciousness. This is the defect of the mode of goodness. Uh, this is explained by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, that one becomes complacent, <coughs> conditioned by a sense of happiness and by the sense of knowledge. You see? Because when you become, when you actually achieve this knowledge, then you, you become happier than other people. Because other people, when they're caught in the sense objects, they're very distressed. You see, they're worried about their money. I heard one song, so I was on, the, on an airplane, and uh, they were playing some music on the speaker system for some <laughs> crazy music. <laughs> and, and this was some rap music. <laughs> and over and over, this musician was saying, I've got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. I've got my mind on my money. <laughs> and I was just sitting there laughing when I was listening to this. <laughs> yeah, this is the mode of fashion. Mind on my money and my money on my mind. Just thinking of these things. Money and woman and car and house and this and that and this and that and this and And this is the only reality he knows. And it's full of anxiety because it's all passing away. It, it, we're all going to be dragged away from these things by time. We're being dragged away from it right now. So a person who comes to this sattva gun mode of goodness, who, who becomes detached from all this, then he's naturally happy. He's not so worried. He's not in anxiety. He knows this. This is coming and going. But still there may be the pride. Huh? The pride and the, and, and, and the conditioning of this happiness. He thinks everything's alright. Because I have this knowledge, I'm fine. But no. Actually the goal of this human form of life is not to remain in this material world, even in the mode of goodness. Because if you're in the mode of goodness, you're still in material nature and it means you still will take birth again. But the actual goal of human life is to get free of birth and death altogether. So the Turiya stage, the fourth stage, is beyond the modes of nature. And this is when one becomes situated completely in pure consciousness, in the self. Hmm? The Atman, the Jiva Atma, the self. Completely situated in the self and the self's own activities. Because beyond this field, it's called the Chaitra Gya, field of, uh, or Chaitra, Chaitra, and we are the Gya, the knower. But so beyond this Karma Chaitra, field of activities, there is a realm of spiritual activity. Hmm? And that realm is known to the soul that has become fully awake to its own identity. Because the soul is itself a personality. Hmm? and is part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Lord Sri Krishna, Mama Aivangsa, Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhutta, Sanatana, Krishna says. These jivas, these souls everywhere, 
whether in human body or ant body or any kind of body, they are my angsa, they are part of me, a part of my own spiritual nature. But again, what is our problem? Uh, is that we are off the track. We have let our mind, our consciousness wander from Krishna, wander away from Krishna, and it has become captured by Maya, this illusion. And now we're all involved in this Maya and all the activities on display in this material world, and we think this is all that's important. You see? And every day we're hearing news of the world and you know, there's a war happening here and there's terrorist bombers there and this is happening and that and we're all... La, 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 la. <laughs> totally in anxiety. Because, why? Because we're accepting this is the only reality. This is it. But on the transcendental platform, on the platform of the soul in its pure state, there unfolds transcendental activities in relationship to Krishna. And the nature of these activities are opposite from the nature of the activities here. What are the activities here? They're asat, achit, nirananda. They are temporary. Hmm? All of our activities here are temporary. They're all going to come to an end. Whatever we are doing, whoever you think you are, you see, all this is going to come to an end at the time of death. And then death, Krishna says, it leads to rebirth. Then there's a new beginning, a new set of senses, a new activity. You see, as demigod or <laughs> as G-O-D, demigod, huh? you know, God, small g, God up there in heaven, or D-O-G, dog, <laughs> down here on earth. <laughs> Either one, but we'll get uh, certainly, as a result of our karma of this lifetime, a new body, a new set of senses, new activities, new situation. And that will also end. So that's at, uh, asat. Asat. Temporary. These activities. And achit, full of ignorance. Hey, we don't really know what's going on. Everything in this world is, is covered over by ignorance. You see, everything is a, ultimately a mystery. It's like I told you, I uh, mentioned the other day, other morning, I had a discussion in the University of Amsterdam. Oh, he's a some big scholar of uh, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. And uh, so this Nietzschean philosophy is that actually the world is chaos. There's two words from old Greek philosophy, chaos and cosmos. Now cosmos you've heard of, it means universe. But actually to the Greeks, it meant more than just universe, it meant an ordered universe. Hmm? A universe of order. And then opposed to that was the idea of chaos. A world of, you see, everything just happening by chance. No order. So this philosopher was an advocate that the world is actually chaos, not cosmos. And of course, me being a Krishna devotee, I'm obviously on the other side. That there is a meaning to the world, there is an order to the world, and that order is given by God. So I asked him, I, I thought the way to deal with him, the best way to deal with him, because you know, there was all these students, and uh, they also were philosophy students, and many of them I could see were also a skeptical tendency. Uh, they, they were not so much inclined to just, you know, believe in religious doctrines. So I thought the d way to deal with this man, because we're having a discussion in front of the students, was just to ask him questions, you know. And that way I could, the students would see the foolishness <laughs> of his position. So one question I asked, I said, my dear sir, can you tell me, you say everything is chaos. And yet we're sitting here in, apparently in the University of Amsterdam. I mean, this is a place with order. This is a room, you see. <laughs> and there are people in this room. And we're, we're having a discussion, language, that's order. Language means order, logic. We're having a discussion of philosophy. But you're saying that ultimately everything is chaos, huh? disordered. So can you tell me, my dear sir, my dear 
Mr. Van der Bach. Are we here in this room, in the University of Amsterdam, discussing philosophy, or are we not? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> the big philosopher, right? <laughs> he doesn't even know if he's there or not. <laughs> so I didn't say anything more, it was just obvious. <laughs> you're going to listen from, to this man, this is the kind of knowledge you're going to get. That he's not even sure if he's in this room or not. <laughs> You see, so, buyer beware, as we say. <laughs> you want to buy into this, you take a big risk. So, yes, everything in this world is mysterious. We're not really sure what's going on. There's so many, all the time in the news, you see, we find that things that we accepted were true are now being found out to not be true anymore. And this is the way life goes on. You know, everything, you, you can expect that everything that you once believed, especially it's tragic, you know, <laughs> when you go through this educational system. All this anxiety for, what is it, 12, 15 years of your life growing up, you know, you have to go to, you're required by law to go to school and then you may take higher studies, college, university, and you have to cram your studies and pass tests, you know, examinations, and you're in all kinds of anxiety, and finally at the end you get your degree. I made it. I've got, you know, a BA degree, MA degree, PH degree, and you can go and say, I learned this. But, you know, uh, what is happening is that year by year, everything you learned as, so, as knowledge so-called advances, everything that you learned is being proved to be not true. You see, all that that you had to study and worry about and write tests for, you know, just like, <laughs> I remember uh, years ago, I forget, it was maybe 10, maybe not by now, must have been 20 years ago. And there was an astrophysicist, a scientist who studies uh, the outer space. And he came out and said to the press, we've made some new discoveries about the sun. You know, with our more powerful instruments. We've made new discoveries about the sun. And what this means is, is that everything that we thought we knew about the sun before, we have to throw out. <laughs> so then I was thinking, what about all those students, <laughs> you know, then they had to <laughs> write all these examinations. Well, you know, the sun is this and that, and you know, and then they hear the scientists, we all have to throw it out. <laughs> it's all useless. <laughs> and what kind of education is that? And this is what is happening. There's a philosopher of science called Karl Popper. And he wrote books about this. Uh, that he said, he said, you can never really say what knowledge is, because it's always changing. So all you can do is just move, you, you just move with the new discoveries, and you can be sure, you have to be sure that whatever you think you know now, will inevitably in the future be proved wrong. And this is our state. And you, you know, I mean, that's not very hopeful. Because what does it mean, advancement of knowledge? I mean, there's, there's even Popper was saying there's no end to this. That means you go through your whole life, you know, rediscovering everything. There's new knowledge, new knowledge, new knowledge, and everything you believed before was wrong, wrong, wrong. And then finally you die. <laughs> and then it goes on, you know, the people after you are dis discovering new knowledge. New so what did you know? <laughs> what did you know in your life? What, you see, that's what I mean. Achit. Everything here in the material world is... Uh, pervaded by ignorance, overshadowed by ignorance. We don't really know what's going on. We like to think what we do, but it's always being shown to us, actually, you don't know. And then finally, Nirananda, our activities in this world are not happy. This is like, again, our Mr. Van der Brock. Uh, so he uh, <coughs> was talking about his chaos theory, his beloved chaos theory of Nietzsche saying, you know, this is more reasonable, rational. And then he was giving the example, you know, uh, what is the example of chaos? Uh, he's referring back to ancient Greek philosophy and so on. And he's saying the Greek tragedies, it's like the Oedipus myth, you know, about Oedipus, the king, who, uh, anyway, it's a long, sad story. He, he ended up killing his own father, not knowing he was his father. He married his mother, not knowing she was his mother. He had a daughter by his mother, uh, not knowing that. And then it was all revealed. 
at the end of the story. He finds out that he's the killer of his own father and, and you know, he, he's been having sex with his own mother for so many years. And, uh, you know, he's so horrified. How could this happen? And he, he was so horrified, he pulled out his own eyes, blinded himself and went off uh, into exile, self-exile. And this, this, he, uh, this Professor Van der Brock mentioned, this is an example, you know, of, of uh, chaos. Life is chaos. Life is tragic, in other words. In other words, life is misery. That was his conclusion. <laughs> in other words, that's what it's coming down to. And, you know, he's, and then he's very skeptical about religion because religions say that life is ultimately blissful. And he didn't like that. He didn't like that idea that, you know, that there's actually a happiness somewhere. No, no, we have to be realistic and look at this world as it is and you'll see it's chaos and it's tragic and it's miserable. And, you know, Nietzsche spoke of the Übermensch. That means the, you know, the real German. That's what it means. Because Nietzsche was very, str very proud of being a German philosopher. And that means a real, you know, square-headed, chiseled-faced, you know, like this. And all kinds of ha horrible things are happening, but you just keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Das muss sein. Yeah. Vorwärts, vorwärts. Marsch schnell. You see? Until you die. <laughs> you die. So, life is hell and then you die. That's the philosophy. So yes, this life, this life, this material life, it is overshadowed by suffering. And, you know, we have to give credit. I mean, Nietzsche was, okay, he died a madman. <laughs> he actually went insane from thinking all these kind of things. The last ten years of life, he couldn't even talk because he was, he was mad. But we have to give him credit. Credit, he wasn't an intelligent person, intelligent enough to see this, this material life as it really is, that it is suffering. There's no hope for happiness. So in that sense, uh, we can give him some credit. But that's not very comfort comforting, is it? You see, you're born into this world and just to be told, life is hell and then you die. That's it. You know, you got nothing look to look forward to. So if that's it, we might as well just, you know, right now. <laughs> What's the point? Uh, but there's something inside us that hopes for something better than that and keeps us going. And that is the soul. So as I said, on the level of spiritual activities, when these unfold, then it's opposite. Then there's sat, eternality. There's chit, complete knowledge. And ananda, bliss. But this is all in relationship with Krishna. And this is the meaning of Krishna consciousness. That we are conscious beings. That is... Our essence, the essence of our being as soul is we are conscious, but that consciousness must become connected to Krishna. And when that connection is made, then transcendental spiritual activities unfold. And this all begins, the seed of these spiritual activities is the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hmm? Therefore it is said in the Shastra that transcendental activities, they are called Shravanadi. Yeah. Adi means beginning and Shravan means hearing. All of these transcendental activities, spiritual activities, hmm, activities of love of God, devotion to God, they are Shravanadi. They begin with hearing. And we can hear now by God's grace. See, this is the reason we have senses. Uh, this is the reason we have ears. Not so that we can hear, you know, lawnmower music. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Music that sounds like someone put a microphone to a lawnmower motor and rip. You know, this is the kind of techno music, this kind of stuff they like. This is not the reason why God gave us ears to listen to that kind of thing. But God gave us ears so that we could hear His holy name, we could hear His kata, the subject matter of His name, form, qualities, activities. And this way our consciousness is raised. And we raised from first hearing, then to chanting, shavanam, kirtanam, then you chant. Huh? And in this way, 
you remember, and then from remembering, so one after the other, spiritual activities unfold. And that starts here, now. We don't have to wait for some heaven to come after death. You start the spiritual activities now. And this is called Bhakti Yoga, the yoga of devotion to Krishna. And by starting this yoga of devotion to Krishna, you can actually experience uh, rising up out of this dream state, this ordinary human dream state, to the mode of goodness, and then from the mode of goodness to the transcendental state, to your state. You can actually experience this yourself. So, Krishna consciousness is not ultimately like many religions. They, they claim, many religions they openly say, ultimately everything is based on faith. But we don't say that. We say everything, it begins with faith. Yes, it begins with faith. You have to start with faith in anything, not just religion, but anything. If you want to be a lawyer, say, you know, which is perfectly mundane occupation. <laughs> lawyer. Prabhupada used to say, lawyer means liar. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if you want to be a lawyer, then uh, you have to have faith, you know, that you, that, because that's a it's a big endeavor. So much education, so much schooling, and you have to pass the uh, uh, examination, uh, jurisprudence examination, be accepted into the lawyerly uh, 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 profession. You have to have some faith, some belief uh, that this is worth so much energy, so much of your time. If you don't have faith, then you won't do it. You see? So even in material things, everything starts with some faith, some, some preliminary sense of worth that this is good. This line of work is good for me. Uh, uh, when you, when, uh, you, know, you want to become a scientist, you have to have faith in science. That's where it starts. You don't know the science, but you have faith in it. And therefore you want to take all these studies and learn it. So we say everything, yes, begins with faith, but it doesn't end with faith. You develop from faith. Adau Shraddha Tata Sadhu Sangha, you come into the association of devotees. Atta Bhajana Kriya, and then you take up this process I've been describing, spiritual activities. Shravanadi, beginning with hearing. And then this brings you to Anartha Nibriti, the dirty things in the heart are cleansed away. And then you come to Nishta, firm position firm position in spiritual life and then ruchi then a taste develops actually this, this chanting of Hare Krishna you start to taste it as being the sweetest thing and then asakti means attachment huh? you become so strongly attached you can't give it up and then bhava ecstasy and then prema pure love of God so these are markers huh? markers on the path back home, back to Godhead. And these are to be experienced. It's not just belief. But you, you know you're making progress as you experience these markers. So this is a process. A process of developing our uh, pure spiritual consciousness, Krishna consciousness and spiritual activities. <laughs> so I thank you very much. We're supposed to stop now. Actually, a little bit over time. Um, maybe if someone has one or two questions which they think are very important. I don't like to disappoint anyone who really thinks they have an important question. Yes? Uh, Prabhu, I still have a basic terminology problem. Because if I take an English uh, vocabulary and I look up the word mind, they say it is spirit. Well, we talk about spirit and soul. Then we have mind. There is a mind. There is a mental body. Yes. Can you give the definition and the relation between soul and mind and spirit and consciousness. Well, this is a good question because it points out uh, points out the um, misfortune of having been born in Western culture. <laughs> Because, you see, Western culture, Western ideology, all Western philosophy, 
psychology, all these things, even the words philosophy, psychology, what language do they come from? Coming from Greek. So all of our, you know, the whole Western mindset goes back to the ancient Greeks. And the problem with the ancient Greeks is they did not know the difference between the soul and the mind. This is, uh, I, I once had a, uh, uh, an exchange uh, to the mail, I wrote a book called Substance and Shadow. The first book I wrote and this somehow came into the hands of a Italian philosophy professor, philosophy professor, a lady in, in, uh, in Italy. And so she wrote to me and she liked the book but she was also making the same point in a, in a different way. She was saying she, she was saying that in your book you have tried to explain your philosophy your Vedanta philosophy in terms of Western philosophy and I appreciated that very much but you have to know that there is also a vocabulary problem she said because and, and she pointed out she said in Western philosophy there has never been a distinction between soul and mind so you know so this is something new for us you know so she was saying this is nice that you're you're, in, you're telling us about this from from the Indian point you know Vedic point of view but you have to understand that it doesn't, you know, correspond to anything <laughs> on this side, <laughs> on the Western side of philosophy. <laughs> so this is something, you know, very new for us and we have to, uh, you know, adjust very much. <laughs> because, uh, going, she said, going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, we have, there's never been any distinction between soul and mind. And now for the first time you're, you know, arguing this, so this is something very remarkable. So, yes. So, but it's not that hard because mind <coughs> is materialized consciousness. So, Prabhupada used to say that it's not that we uh, become mindless. It's not that our goal is to become mindless, but to purify the mind. Because when the mind is purified, you see the basis of the mind, the basis of activity, the basis of everything we know, as I said, is consciousness. So mind is simply a certain uh, pollution of consciousness, a certain uh, conditioning of consciousness. Just like body is too. Body is just a more gross condition of consciousness. Because we are aware through the senses of this body. There's consciousness coming out through this body. So we have to purify the consciousness and in this way uh, cleanse ourselves off from this contamination and in this way then we will see that the body the functions of the body are actually functions of material nature the functions of mind are actually also functions of material nature on a more subtle level and our problem as soul is that we have been identifying with that and that's the problem of ahamkara or false ego which is the last snare of maya, which I was telling you about the mode of goodness. One may come up to the mode of goodness, but still there's a problem of identifying with that and becoming proud and complacent and, you know, thinking everything's all right. So we have to o overcome this wrong identity. And this is, we have in the uh, English language the word vicarious. Vicarious means... Um, a kind of indirect experience, which is, which is what we're doing in this material world. We're indirectly experiencing things through this body and through this mind. We are the soul. We are never in direct contact with body or mind. We are always different from it. But indirectly, vicariously, it's like, and, and this vicariousness occurs through attachment. It's just like another person. Here's a simple example. Uh, you may have a friend, someone you're very attached to, very close to. And so you're very sympathetic with that person. So suppose that person uh, hurts himself or herself. Suppose uh, in the kitchen he or she is you know, cutting some vegetables and cuts his or her finger and bleeds. Now you're very attached to that person. So you, you feel, you actually, because of that attachment, you feel in yourself, 
you feel like this, you know, you, you feel a twinge of, of horror and shock and you rush to that person and you take, oh, let me help you. And you're, 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 you're feeling very strongly. This, this is the person in pain actually, has actually cut, they're feeling pain, but you're also feeling pain. You're also feeling very, very concerned and very, you know, empathetic with this person. In fact, I was just reading the other day, I came across a reference, there's a psychological phenomenon that they know. It's called male pseudo-pregnancy. <laughs> when a man is very attached to his wife, and his wife becomes pregnant, then the, ma the man may also, out of so much identifying with his wife, may also develop the same symptoms of pregnancy. You know, <laughs> like that, that you know, like the, there's this, women get this morning sig sickness when they're pregnant, they feel like they're going to vomit, you know, when they get up, you know, and the man may also get